In previous class, we learned about basic laws in electronics. Now we want to control the current and the voltage in our electrical circuits. We will get familiar with basic elements that combine those two quantities. When designing an electronic device, we want signals that go in the input be transformed into other signals going from the output. Electrical device is some kind of black box. We don't know what's inside until we start to project it. So first of all, we have to focus on basic elements from which we can make electrical circuits. Before we go into the description of elements, let's talk about series of values. Let's suppose that we have calculated in our circuit we need a resistor of 724 ohm resistance. First of all, we have to answer the question, are such elements available? The answer is no. We have to realize that all the values of resistances are systematized. So there is no resistor of 724 resistance. 724 ohm resistor we can create from three resistors connected in serial. 680, 33 and 11 ohm. Now let's talk about color bands on resistors and how to read them. Note that the color in a table do not occur randomly. There is a certain order, almost like in a rainbow, from grey to silver. Most often we see those with the four bands designations. The first two bands define a number. The next band is a multiplier. It tells us how many zeros we need to add to a number. The last band tells us about the element's tolerance. What is it? It is a parameter that tells us how much the actual value can differ from the one written on it. If, for example, our resistor has 100 ohms and the tolerance is 5%, it means that it should have 100 ohms, but its actual value can be in a range of 95 to 105 ohms. The last and very popular method of marking resistors is marking them on a surface, like in surface mounting devices. SMD. In analogy to the previous method, two three first digits tell us about a certain number, and the last one about the number of zeros. For example, we have an element with the designation 105. This means that we have 10 and we have to add 5 zeros to it, so we have 1 mega ohm. And how to mark the small value? R surface comma, so when we have 0 R1, that means we have 0, 1 ohm. We could wonder what are those elements for. Resistors limit the current flowing in a circuit, causing a voltage drop on them. Resistors are also temperature dependent. It means that the bigger current flows through the resistor, the more it gets warmed up. So we have to choose resistors not only in terms of resistance, but also in terms of maximum power. Average resistors have maximum power of 250 mW or 600 mW. Therefore, we have to choose resistors which maximal power is around 30% or up to twice bigger than the power we have calculated. So in this situation, we aren't looking for a resistor that has 200 ohms and around 600 maximum mW power, but we are looking for a resistor that has 200 ohms resistance and around 1 watt power. Some resistors does not have accurate resistance, but they can emit a lot of energy without being damaged, such as heating resistors. In summary, resistors are the most popular two terminal elements which convert electricity into heat. They can be used to limit the current flowing the circuit or cause a voltage drop on an element. The main parameter in resistors is a resistance, so this is the best example of Ohm's law. The first and the most frequently used element is resistor. Resistor is made of conductive material in such a way that they have its own nominal resistance. Resistors are ohmic elements, that means Ohm's law work all time in them. They are also linear elements, that means voltage on a resistor is proportional to the current flowing through the resistor. In the European Union, the most frequent symbol of a resistor is a rectangle, while in the United States, the most frequent symbol of resistor is broken wave. 
As it is not difficult to guess, the basic parameter will be resistance, expressed in ohms. There are resistance starting from single ohms up to single giga ohms. We see a few examples here. You can see that some are microscopic and some are very large. The simplest, and unfortunately not very often seen way to designate its resistance, is to write it on the casing. The most common description of resistors are colored bands on its casing. This is the code that for beginners seems difficult to remember. Mentioned resistors have their value of resistance constant over time. However, when we regulate something or increase volume of audio, there is a strong possibility that we regulate adjustable resistor or potentiometer. Adjustable resistors have only two pins and they are just resistors where you can regulate the resistance. Do you remember the formula for resistance? Resistance is proportional to the length, so changing the position of the shifter is just adjusting resistance to our resistor. Potentiometers have three pins. The two extremities are connected to the tops of the track and the middle one is to the shifter. We can assume that this element is an adjustable voltage divider. Shifter chooses a place between extreme positions and depending on it, the proper voltage will appear on the output. Potentiometers can be rotary, slide or assemble, as well as into single and multi-turn. There is also a linear and logarithmic division. But what does it mean? When in linear potentiometer we move the slider, we know that in the half of the distance it will have a half of the resistance. In logarithmic division, dependence is simply logarithmic, so together with further displacement, the resistance changes as a logarithmic function. Where do we use it? For example, in audio, because human hearing is constructed in a way that impression of volume is exponentially, so to linearize this effect we have to use logarithmic potentiometers. Now it is time to get to know a second element without which many electronic devices would not be able to work. A capacitor. These gather and release specified portions of energy. The simplest capacitor consists of two electrodes which gather electric charge and an insulator between them. There are several types of capacitors. This is a symbol of standard capacitor with a fixed capacity. It does not have a specified polarization, so it doesn't matter which terminal is connected to the higher voltage. These are mainly ceramic capacitors. This is a symbol of polarized capacitor. These are mainly electrolytic or tantalum. Here it matters which terminal is connected to the higher voltage and which one is connected to the lower voltage. You should check if there is a plus or minus sign on your capacitor. If there is a plus sign, it means that this terminal should be connected to the higher voltage and if there is a minus sign, this terminal should be connected to the lower voltage. This is a variable capacitor. It means that you can adjust its capacity to your needs. When discussing resistors, we said that current value is proportional to the voltage value and proportionality factor is resistance. With capacitors, the situation is slightly different. The current value is proportional to the voltage value change in time. This component is the voltage derivative, and it tells us that the faster the voltage changes, the higher current will flow in the circuit. C is capacitance of our capacitor, and the higher is the capacitance, the higher current will flow. Here we have a formula which tells us how much energy will be stored in a capacitor. It is a product of capacitor's capacitance and the voltage squared divided by 2. The law of conservation of energy tells that you cannot change the voltage abruptly, because such a change in energy would require an infinite amount of power. When there is no voltage change, reactance is equal to infinity. So for DC circuit, it is a gap. The faster is the voltage change, the higher will be the value current, which corresponds to decreasing reactance. It is also worth adding that resistors were chosen in terms of resistance and power, 
So here we select capacitors in terms of capacity and maximum operating voltage. This is because the higher is the voltage, the greater is the probability that spark will jump between electrodes, which may lead to insulation damage. The best practice is to use capacitors with maximum operating voltage around 30% higher than maximum working voltage, which can possibly occur on the element. There are more similarities between capacitors and resistors. Capacitors may also be connected in series or in parallel, which gives different resultant capacitance. However, this is opposite to the resistors. In parallel connection, resultant capacitance is sum of individual capacitances, and in serial connection, it is a sum of inverse capacitances. Serial connection gives lower resultant capacitance, while parallel connection gives higher resultant capacitance. Coils are elements that are made of wire coiled to create windings. They may have a core on which these windings are located, or they may be coreless, and then they are called air coils. In many situations, coils can be treated as the opposite to the capacitors. They are usually used in complex systems, so we will describe them only briefly. This is coil symbol. Coil's main parameter is its inductance, L, and it is measured in Henry's. Second parameter is maximum operating current. This is because coil's wire has a resistance which dissipates energy in form of heat. If current is too big, you can either melt the wire or melt wire's insulation, causing short circuit. Coil is also a kind of magazine because it stores energy in form of magnetic field. Just like capacitors and resistors, coils also can be connected in parallel or in series. Formulas for resultant inductances are similar to those of resistors. In serial connection, resultant inductance is a sum of individual inductances and in parallel connection, it is a sum of inverse inductances. However, you have to be really careful while connecting coils because their magnetic fields may overlap. Unlike in capacitors, here coil voltage is proportional to current derivative. Coil inductance, L, is a proportionality factor. It indicates how current change will affect the voltage. Minus sign informs you that generated voltage has opposite direction to the flowing current. Coil can be compared to a flywheel, where rotational speed is current and inductance stands for mass. When in motion, flywheel cannot be stopped instantly because it stores energy. And so does coil. Current flow in the wire cannot be stopped abruptly. Coils have many different applications and the most obvious one is electromagnet. When current is passed through the wire, inside the solenoid is generated a magnetic field with field lines directed according to current flow. When in cooperation with magnets, changing magnetic field on coils can be used to change angular position of a shaft. This is the simplest example of an electric motor. If you keep the system in this form, but instead of changing magnetic field on the coils, change angular position of a shaft, the current in the coil wires will induce itself and you get the simplest generator. Coils can also transfer electrical energy via magnetic field. In order to achieve that, windings must be very close to each other and current must be alternating. Such an electric machine is called a transformer. Resistors, capacitors and coils belong to the basic group of passive elements. Current and voltage on them are in some way proportional to each other. Now we will move to semiconductors. Now it is time to say something about semiconductors. We have to know that there are two basic types of semiconductors, type P and type N. The connection of those two semiconductors are so-called semiconductor connections. It is worth you to say 
that semiconductors get disintegrated at 175 degrees Celsius, so we cannot exceed this limit. The basic device made with connection of those two semiconductors is so-called diode. There are many types of diodes. Here we have their symbols. Diode is two terminal device. The one terminal is called anode and the other one cathode. Usually anode is signed with letter A next to it. Anode is connected to the P semiconductor and cathode is connected to the N semiconductor. Diodes are like gates on a highway. We can pass only in one direction and we have to pay it with a voltage drop. At this moment, we connect higher potential to the anode and lower potential to the cathode. Current will flow through the diode with characteristic voltage drop 0.7 volt. Now, let's look at the characteristic of our diode. Around 0.7 volts, our diode starts to conduct more and more current. If we connect our diode to the 9 volt power supply and the voltage drop will be around 0.7 or 0.8, the current flowing through our diode will be too big. So we have to add a serial resistor to limit the current. When the battery is reversed, the current will not flow and there will be no voltage drop. Now we have to say something about rectifiers. Rectifiers are such devices made of a diode or several one that they allow to flow current only in one direction and the output of a rectifier. Here we have voltage supply. Its voltage changes sinusoidally from positive to negative. On the output of our device, we have such characteristic. At this moment, current will flow with the same direction as voltage, on a positive side. In the next moment, the current also wants to flow with the same direction as voltage, but on the negative side. The diode won't allow us to get the negative current. Here, we have a rectifier made of many diodes. It's so-called Gretz bridge. So let's analyze what this circuit does. At this moment, when the voltage on an input is positive, the diode 1 and 3 will conduct, while 4 and 2 are turned off. At the next moment, when the voltage on an input is negative, the diodes 4 and 2 will turn on, while first and third will turn off. So no matter whether positive or negative voltage we have on the input, we always have positive voltage and positive current on the output of our device. We have to remember that the voltage drop on such a, such a bridge is around 1.4 to up to 3 volts. Diodes have two basic parameters, the maximum current that can flow through the diode and the maximum voltage that can be applied in an opposite direction and doesn't break a diode or make a short circuit. They also have another important parameter, which is voltage drop. For silicon or other normal diodes, it is usually 0.7 up to 1 volt. Zener diodes are stabilizing diodes. In the direction of conductivity, they behave as normal rectifying diode, while in the opposite direction, they have carefully selected breakdown voltage. It is normal state for them. They have two basic parameters, the Zener voltage, which is the breakdown voltage, and the maximum power that can flow through the diode. In this example, we will use 9 volts voltage supply and a Zener diode for 5.6 volts and 1.3 watts. 
from the first law of Kirchhoff, we know that current flowing through the resistor is equal to the current flowing through the diode and current flowing through the load. If we don't connect the load, the whole current will flow through the Zener diode. So the current is proportional to the power of losses on a diode. In our example, the current flowing through the circuit is around 232 milliamps. So the resistor must have 1.5 up to 2 watts maximum power and around 15 ohm resistance. Diodes are very useful elements. We will use them many, many times. Elements with which we had contact until now were only load for the whole system. They didn't have possibility to control the electrical current. If we want to control everything by switches and potentiometers, we can easily realize that we are too slow and uh, there are too many changes of parameters. Elements that can cope with higher voltage and higher power are for example relays or contact trons, but they are also too slow. The best option are transistors. Transistors are fast, they can switch high power and they can cope with higher frequencies. Transistors are free terminal elements. There are many types of transistors and they have different symbols, but first of all we will talk about bipolar transistors. They have base, collector and emitter. Base current flows through base to the emitter and collector's current also flows to emitter. Between those two currents there is a special relationship. In catalogs it is called H if E and this says how much greater current will flow through collector than through base. Additionally, we have to pay attention to the fact that base emitter collection behaves like a normal diode and the voltage we are interested in is between emitter and collector. Let us consider the example that we want to control motor with transistor. Motor has to be supplied with 20 volts and around 200 milliampers, while we can control it only with 5 volts and around few milliampers. First of all, we have to check the HFE parameter, which for our transistor is 200. So we know that current flowing through the base will be 200 times less than current flowing through the collector. Let's suppose that in our case, the current flowing through the base is equal to 10 milliamps. We know also that the connection between base and emitter is a normal diode so the voltage drop will be around 0.65 volts. We know that, that the maximum resistance of the resistor here is around 470 ohms. Let us analyze what will happen with our circuit. When we connect 0 volts or we don't connect our 5 volts to the base input, the current in a base will not flow. And due to the fact that current in a base will not flow, there will be also no current flowing in the collector. All the voltage drop will drop on an engine and it will be so-called voltage between collector and emitter. But engine won't work. If we collect the 5 volts to the input of our device, it will cause the current of a base flowing. Current of base will cause the current of collector flowing with maximum possible density of 200 milliampers. The voltage between collector and emitter will drop to the lowest possible 0.2 volts and this is called saturation voltage of transistor. Our motor will start to turn. In this example we want to supply free power LED diodes in our device. Each diode has 3 volt drop on it. The total voltage drop on diodes will be 9 volts. The voltage of saturation of our transistor is around 0.2 volts. So there is still 2.8 volts to, and it will drop on our resistor on the collector. The current flowing through the base will be around 16 milliampers. And from the voltage that will drop on this resistor, we know that its resistance should be 680 ohms. The resistance of RC resistor 
is around 8.4 ohms, but we know there is no possibility to find such resistor. So we could change the current flowing through the base and its resistor into another. All the examples we have already mentioned are made with NPN transistors, which means negative, positive and negative semiconductor. There is also a second type of transistor, PNP, which means positive, negative and positive layers of semiconductor. It is worth it to say that in every type, the connection between base and emitter is a normal diode. So now let's modify our examples that they can work with PNP transistor. Of course, we have to change the NPN transistors into PNP transistors and reverse the polarization of the voltage in our device. So reverse the voltage of power and reverse the voltage on the input of our base. We talked about bipolar transistors. Now let us move to the unipolar ones, especially MOSFETs. The previous transistors were controlled by the current. These ones are con controlled by the voltage. Their pins are called the gate, drain and the source. The control voltage is between the gate and the source. The output current is the current of the drain and the voltage at the output is the drain source voltage. One could ask, what about the gate's current? The gate with the source behaves like a capacitor and the current does not flow when we apply a constant voltage. At the moment of switching through the gate, the current flows for a short moment. The internal drain source connection is called the transistor channel. In the catalog note, we can read from the so-called the output characteristic, which gate source voltage is needed to allow a sufficient large output current to flow. So now, let's change those transistors into MOSFETs. We know that current flowing through drain have to be 200 mA. So the voltage on the input of our transistor will allow the current to flow and to turn the motor. Let's suppose that we have zero volts on gate source in our transistor. The transistor is turned off, so there will be no current flowing through drain and source. The motor won't be turning. In MOSFETs, there is no saturation of voltage in transistors. The voltage is only determined by the resistance in our circuits. As we see, transistors are very useful elements. Without them, any modern electronics would be made. Now it's time to get to know the first multitasking electronical circuit. Its name is Operational Amplifier. Operational means that it's capable of performing arithmetical operations. And Amplifier means it's capable of amplifying signals. The basic amplifier has five pins. Upper and lower are power supplies. This one pin is output signal and those two are input signal. This is so-called non-inverting input and inverting input. This amplifier amplifies the voltage between the inputs. Let's mark non-inverting input as VA and inverting as VB. The output voltage will be equal to that formula. The K factor is very large, 10 up to 100,000. So theoretically, if the difference between inputs is zero, the voltage output will be also zero. Let's suppose the difference between voltages is around 0.01 volts. And the K factor is 100,000. So from the equation, we know that output voltage should be around 1000 volts. But in fact, it will be similar to the maximum voltage supply. Such amplifiers can be supplied from symmetrical voltage or asymmetrical voltage. In this amplifier, the voltage output will be from minus 15 up to 15 volts. And in this amplifier, the output voltage will be from 0 up to 15 volts. Another very important feature of amplifiers is that, that when we connect inputs to the output, we can create a feedback loop. In this situation, when we connect the inverting input to the output, our amplifier tends to stabilize the initial value. The simplest solution is to connect the output to the input with minus. 
This is so-called voltage follower. The voltage on the output will be the same as voltage on the input. We place them in devices where the resistance of the system is so high that it's unable to control the next device. The second solution is non-inverting and inverting amplifier. Always two resistors are needed. We have to remember that in non-inverting amplifier, the amplification has to be more than one, while inverting amplifier can amplify or suppress the signal. But the output voltage will have opposite sign than input voltage. Here we have non-inverting amplifier powered asymmetrically from 0 to 20 volts. We know that input voltage is 1.5 volts and the resistors are 2 and 18 kilo ohm. So from the equation, we know that output voltage will be 15 volts and K factor is equal to 10. Here we have a reversing amplifier powered symmetrically from minus 10 up to 10 volts. Resistors were selected in such a way that the amplifier suppressed the signal 10 times. So when the voltage input is 5 volts, we know that the voltage output will be minus 0.5 volts. Here we also have an inverting amplifier, but it is powered asymmetrically from 0 up to 20 volts. So the voltage on the output can change only from 0 up to 20. So we will be not able to have minus 0.5 voltage. Instead, we will have 0 volts on the output. This system is so-called subtraction amplifier or differential. Subtraction amplifier amplifies the difference between the inputs. So if on the first input we have 4 volts and on the second we have 3 volts, the difference is 1 volt. If you change those two, 4 into 3 and 3 into 4, we'll get minus 1 on the output. All the resistors are 20 kilo ohm, so the K factor of the amplifier is 1. The last system analyzed will be summing amplifier. It sums all the voltages on inputs. It can be more than just two. Resistors here can be different. We can choose whatever we want. Due to the fact that on the output we have 3 volts and we have this equation, we know that voltages in, on inputs are negative and they are also divided by 2. Operational amplifiers can occur in castings where we can find 1, 2 or 4 peaks of them. The only common pins will be power supplies. In normal situation, output voltage from the amplifier is 0.3 or 0.5 lower than supply voltage. And sometimes we have to give the voltage that is equal to supply voltage. In this case, we have to use rail-to-rail -rail amplifiers, which can give the voltage that is equal to the supply voltage. Not to damage our amplifier, we have to stick to two rules. First of all, under no circumstances should we connect the voltage input that is higher than positive voltage supply and lower than negative voltage supply. And the second rule is that we cannot connect load that is too large for our amplifier. However, all current capacities are different for different models. Comparator is an element very similar to operational amplifier, but it does not include a feedback loop. Symbols of those elements are identical. Comparator can only achieve two states, the lowest potential or the highest potential, and thus it is used to compare input voltages. This also means that every operational amplifier can be used as a comparator, but no comparator can be used as an operational amplifier. Comparators also work faster because they are less complicated. If you want to compare voltages of magnitude around 20 or 30 volts, you can also include a resistor on the output of the comparator. In this case, the output voltage may be reduced to less than 3.3 volts, which is especially useful in digital systems. The smaller is the value of the resistor, the faster the comparator will work. In this section we focused on most important electrical elements used to create analogous electrical circuits. 
There are many different types of each of these elements and every one of them has different application. In order to design circuits with desired parameters, you need to get to know each one of these elements and learn to use them in practice. In the next episode, we will learn more about digital technology.